You think Vikings just suffered from thirst on their brutal ocean voyages? Think again. While most sailors were dying of dehydration, Vikings mastered ways to turn deadly salt water into life-saving fresh water. And here's the brutal truth. Drinking seawater makes thirst worse. Its salt is roughly three times what your kidneys can handle. It pulls water out of your cells and kills you faster. But Viking crews survived months at sea. They used simple, repeatable methods, some that predated widespread European practice by centuries, that let long ships stay at sea longer than almost any vessel of their time. The problem was huge. A typical longship carried 30 to 60 warriors for raids that could last up to three months. At one gallon of fresh water per man per day, that's 30 to 60 gallons every single day. Over weeks, barrels rot, water goes green, and sickness spreads. You can't win with a hold full of slimy water. Space on a longship was precious. Water barrels meant less room for weapons, food, or loot. Vikings needed reliable freshwater solutions, or those legendary voyages wouldn't have been possible. In this video, I'll reveal the seven methods Vikings used to make seawater drinkable. Everything from clever distillation hacks to natural filtration and rain harvesting tricks using materials they had on every ship. These techniques kept crews alive and gave the Norse a naval edge in the North Atlantic. Method 1. The Sail Distillation System The Vikings turned their sails into giant stills. This was no makeshift rain catcher. It was a purpose-built distillation rig that used fire, fabric, and seamanship to squeeze drinkable water out of the ocean itself. Here's the setup. Woolen sail sections were stretched tight over large iron cauldrons filled with seawater. The cauldrons sat in sand-filled wooden boxes, so fires could burn beneath them without threatening the deck. Steady low heat brought the seawater to a slow boil. Steam rose, hit the cool wool, condensed, and the fresh droplets ran down into collection vessels placed at the sail's edges. Salt stayed behind in the cauldron. It wasn't random craft work. It was practical engineering. Different wools behaved differently. Tightly woven fine wool trapped condensation best, so higher grade sails produced more water. Masters would read wind humidity and temperature to decide when and where to run the still. Night and calm weather worked best because cooler air improved condensation. In optimal conditions, a well-run sail distillation system could yield enough fresh water for dozens of men. Estimates put some setups in the range of 15 to 20 gallons per day which could keep a 40-man crew going through short, calm spells. Archaeological finds, oversized cauldrons and saga descriptions back up the idea that Vikings carried gear suited to sustain distillation, not just cooking. The trick was temperature control. Too hot and steam escaped before it condensed. Too cool and nothing happened. Shipmasters learned to bank fires and manage fuel driftwood, whale oil, and rendered fat, so the still could run 12 to 16 hours with minimal attention. A huge bonus was how distillation also purified spoiled barrel water. Heat killed contaminants. Condensation left behind rot and foul taste. Water that had gone green and sickening could be reborn as clear, drinkable water. Vikings also developed simple quality checks. A metallic or salty aftertaste meant the run needed repeating, clear, Flat-tasting water meant success. It was practical science learned at sea. Distillation worked when seas were calm and fuel was on hand. But on stormy voyages or when fuel ran low, Vikings turned to a different technique that used nothing but the ocean's motion itself. Method two, the ice harvesting technique. When seawater freezes, it leaves most of its salt behind. Vikings knew this instinctively, and they turned that simple fact into a reliable water source. This wasn't random ice chopping. Vikings learned to read ice. Fresh ice is clear or slightly blue and rings when struck. Old salty ice is cloudy, gray, and gives a dull thud. Those clues let them pick the best pieces from yards away. Harvesting was hard work and dangerous. Crews used special ice axes and hooks to break flows and haul chunks aboard. The best ice came from flow edges, new, unwashed, and least contaminated by spray. Then they ran a two-stage melt. First, they let the ice partially thaw and drained off the first runoff. That water carried the bulk of dissolved salt. Next, they fully melted the remaining ice to collect water that was effectively fresh. That simple rinse cut salt levels dramatically. A single good flow could supply a crew for days. In northern winters, ice harvesting often outperformed other methods. Even near Britain and Ireland, 
cold snaps produced harvestable ice along coasts. Storage was practical and ingenious. Vikings kept ice in the coolest, shadiest holds, insulated with wool and hides. Some ships had dedicated ice bays to slow melting and preserve supply for weeks. They also refined the melt itself, slowly melting ice, left to drip in shade or warm gently, produced cleaner water than tipping ice into a hot cauldron. Taste tests were the final check. Seasoned sailors could sense tiny salt traces and reprocess any questionable batches. Ice worked when the north was cold, but in summer or southern waters, Vikings needed something that ran all the time. That's where Method 3 comes in, turning the ship itself into a water treatment system. Method 3 the sand and charcoal filtration system. Vikings built portable waterworks from beach sand, gravel, and charcoal. This wasn't a sieve. It was a multi-stage filter tuned for seawater and rotten barrel water. The basic stack was simple and effective. On the bottom, they would have coarse gravel or broken pottery to stop large grit and give drainage. In the middle, fine sand to catch smaller particles and turbidity. On top, crushed charcoal to absorb taste, odor, and organic contaminants. They chose materials with care. Beach sand worked best because waves had already cleaned and sized the grains. Silver sand trapped sediment well, but wasn't as good for salty water. Charcoal wasn't random either. Birch charcoal was prized, very porous, great at adsorption. Oak charcoal lasted longer and could be reused. Construction was clever and portable. Vikings used wooden barrels or woven baskets lined with cloth. They drilled small drainage holes and layered materials in roughly equal thirds of gravel, sand, and charcoal. Maintenance was routine and smart. They backwashed filters by pouring clean water backwards to flush out trapped grit. Charcoal could be reactivated by reheating it in a low fire restoring its absorption power. Simple care kept the system going for months. This didn't remove all salt, but it cut salinity dramatically, enough to make brackish water drinkable and to turn questionable shore water into safe water in a pinch. More importantly, it removed bacteria, smells, and tastes that made stored water lethal. They even developed rapid-use setups for crises, finer materials, and multiple passes to clean water faster, though with slightly lower quality. Small personal filters could be carried by warriors. The technique's real advantage was reliability. Unlike boiling or distillation, Filtration runs constantly with minimal fuel. As long as sand, gravel, and wood were available, Vikings could keep water flowing. But on long trips, they also turned everyday supplies into purification tools. The next method shows how they used what they carried to make water safe, no matter where they sailed. Method four, cloth distillation. When big stills or filters weren't possible, Vikings used what they always had on board, cloth, rope, and wind. This is low-tech distillation, built from soaked fabric and clever rigging, but it worked surprisingly well. Here's the idea. Long strips of wool were soaked in seawater and hung to dry. As wind and sun drew moisture out of the cloth, vapor condensed on cooler strips downwind and then dripped into collection vessels. Fabric choice mattered. Loosely woven wool absorbed lots of water and released it slowly which was ideal. Linen soaked less, tight weaves trapping water and reducing evaporation. Vikings knew which textiles to use and how to arrange them for best yield. Output was steady, but modest. In good conditions, a rig could produce a couple of gallons a day, not enough to replace full stores, but enough to supplement supplies or keep key crew alive. The methods shown during long cruises where fuel or calm weather for a cauldron weren't available. The water quality was good. Slow evaporation left salts and most bacteria behind. The resulting condensate tasted clean and was safe to drink, comparable to more elaborate stills when done right. But when crews needed large volumes fast, Vikings turned to a method that used the sun itself. Method 5. The Solar Concentration Technique When the sun was out, Vikings used it like a furnace. They turned polished shields and metal into mirrors that focused sunlight onto pots of seawater, boiling them fast and making steam that could be condensed into fresh water. The idea was simple. The execution was clever. Polished bronze or silver shields acted as reflectors. Multiple shields were angled together to concentrate light onto a single vessel. With precise setup, 
water boiled in minutes instead of hours. They didn't just hold mirrors up randomly. Vikings built compound reflector arrays, groups of shields or polished plates set at exact angles, so rays from different directions met at one hot spot. That multiplier effect created intense heat without any fuel. When conditions were right, output was impressive enough water that a single system could supply a significant portion of a crew's needs in a sunny day. Unlike fire-based stills, solar rigs used no fuel and left no smoke trail. They made portable versions for beach camps, polished plates, small curved reflectors, and leather condensers that could be assembled in minutes. In summer, long daylight hours in northern waters more than made up for lower sun intensity. Safety was part of the routine. Concentrated sunlight could ignite wood or cloth, so crews kept flammables clear of the focal zone and watched for sparks. Solar rigs were powerful when the weather allowed, but Vikings also relied on methods that worked in any condition. Method six, the natural evaporation chambers. When fuel or sun weren't reliable, Vikings built passive waterworks into the ship itself. They turned hull space, hides, and planks into natural evaporation chambers that ran continuously using only small temperature differences. The concept is simple and elegant. Enclose seawater so it can evaporate slowly, then collect the vapor on cool surfaces. No fire, no mirrors, just smart use of the ship's microclimates. Vikings sealed off lower sections of the hold with planks and waterproof hides. Shallow pans of seawater sat at the bottom. Above them, they placed cool metal plates or wet cloths to catch condensation. They controlled humidity with simple vents, just enough airflow to encourage evaporation, but not so much that vapor escaped. That balance kept condensation steady and reliable. Quality was excellent. Slow evaporation left salts and microbes behind, producing clean, tasteless water that needed no reheating or further treatment. Natural chambers kept ships alive in bad weather. But what about when no seawater was available at all? That's where the seventh and most ingenious method comes in. Extracting fresh water from places others dismissed as useless. Method seven, underground seepage extraction. When islands looked bone dry, Vikings knew there was often water just below the surface. They learned to tap hidden fresh water that had seeped through sand and rock, naturally filtered and separated from seawater. The principle was simple and reliable. Rain and groundwater percolate through layers of soil and sand. Salt gets left behind. Fresh water rises in pockets you can reach with a shovel, if you know where to dig. Finding the spots was a skill. Greener grass, certain coastal plants, damp soil, and even seabird behavior pointed to likely wells. Slightly salty or silty water was treated with settling and simple filtration. Let sediment drop, skim the clear water, then filter, or run it through sand and charcoal. Leaving a hole to settle for hours often produced much cleaner water at the surface. Yield depended on location. In the best spots, a single well could provide 20 to 30 gallons a day. Poorer sites still often added useful supplements to ship stores. Vikings also used the holes as temporary reservoirs, topping them up over several days before departing. Storage and logistics were smart. Water from wells was transferred into barrels, skins, or buried caches for safe transport. This method worked in surprisingly barren places tiny, rocky islets and exposed beaches where surface water was absent, it turned otherwise unusable coasts into reliable resupply points. Taken together with ice, distillation, filtration, and solar methods, these wells let Vikings build a full, redundant water system that kept crews afloat where others would have failed. This story isn't just about clever hacks, it's about adaptation. Surrounded by undrinkable ocean, Vikings didn't give up. They observed, experimented, and built layered solutions that turned ships into mobile waterworks. Those seven techniques let crews stay away from land for months. In some accounts, well-equipped ships could operate four to six months between resupplies. That water security changed everything. Longer raids, wider trade routes, deeper exploration. It was as important as their ships, weapons, or navigation skills. So next time someone calls ancient sailors primitive, remember the Vikings, practical scientists of the sea who solved a life or death problem with observation, craft, and system thinking.